Next up, we have another Canadian, uh, Andreas Dilger. He works for Intel. Uh, he's based in Calgary, Canada. He's been involved in the development of Lustre since its inception, from early prototypes in 2000 until today. Andreas has been one of the lead Lustre developers, designing and developing a wide variety of features. Since joining Intel in 2012, he's moved into the position of principal Lustre architect. <laughs> he also uses Lustre at home. Talk about like eating your own dog food, man. <laughs> you are the man. Ladies and gentlemen, Andreas Dilger. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Um, so today I'm talking about um, upcoming Lustre features. And um, you know, I do this presentation every year. And I think it's important um, you know, to focus on, on features that are um, you know, being developed in the short term. Um, one of the, you know, lots of people can stand up and talk about, you know, what might be in, in five or ten years, but who knows really what's, <laughs> what's uh, actually going to happen. And so I'm, and, and I don't want people to misconstrue to say that I don't know what's going to happen in five years. I just prefer to, to not prognosticate on stuff that may or may not ever be developed. And don't take that negatively at all. Um, Anyway, so um, I think it's also important to look at, uh, um, you know, the features is not just as, you know, a bunch of, of individual code, but um, really that, uh, you know, when we're doing these things, we're, we're trying to focus on, on um, you know, continuously improving things for users and, uh, you know, how Lustre performs, right? I mean... There's, you know, depending on the year, right, there's more focus on, on usability and then, you know, a refocus on um, performance and things like that. And um, all of the times, you know, we're really, we develop what, um, you know, the users are, are asking for. And um, so, um, but that, since it's a community effort, um, you know, there's a wide variety of of, uh, of inputs, and uh, hopefully we can we can meet all of those different demands. Um, so, you know, there's the a list of different things here. Some of them are performance related, um, usability, uh, WAN, um, especially from Indiana is doing some interesting work that's you know primarily focused on using uh, Lustre in in different, um, you know, remote um, access environments. Um, some work that's, uh, that's, you know, trying to segregate Lustre into, you know, subdomains and things like that. Uh, optimization for um, concurrent file reads and uh, looking forward, um, you know, towards 2.10, um, you know, multi-rail is accessibility. Um, so there's really uh, improvements in a variety of areas. Um, one of the, you know, Peter was, was commenting about one of the newer areas for Lustre is, is uh, using, you know, ZFS as the backing storage. And, um, you know, I'm focusing here on ZFS. There's no plans at all that LDISCFS will go away. Um, you know, it's, it has a wide uh, um, usage base as well. Google is very interested in in uh, LDISCFS, and we'll continue to um, use LDISCFS and support it. But um, you know, there's interesting work being done, um, not only with how Lustre interacts with uh, ZFS, but in the core ZFS work itself. Um, and uh, you know, there's some interesting um, uh, information from Canonical, a couple of you know, months ago, maybe not even a couple of months ago, maybe a month ago, um, that they're shipping ZFS as part of their stock distro. And, um, you know, I think that that's an encouraging sign that, uh, you know, there is a definitely a demand for using ZFS because of the advanced features. And I won't go into all the details of what ZFS is, but we're working to make a ZFS work better with Lustre. Um, in 2.8, there was a lot of work done um, 
to integrate uh, Lustre with a, a one megabyte ZFS block size. And um, in late breaking news, the, the, the feat version of ZFS that um, supports the one megabyte block size was not included stock with the 2.8 release because um, some of the other changes that came from upstream didn't work well with um, the memory demands that Lustre was putting onto it, and so there was deadlocks in our testing. We've backed off. It doesn't mean that we've, you know, you can't build that release, and it works fine for many people. Um, but that's something that's that's ongoing. Um, there's work being done to improve the file create performance and other ZFS metadata performance um, to catch up to the level where LDISCFS is today. And by all rights, LDISCFS has, um, you know, we've optimized it for you know, more than 10 years, right, to get to this level. And, uh, you know, ZFS, um, we're putting in the same work. Um, beyond that, in, uh, not, not for the 2.9 release, but, um, well, some of it for 2.9, some of it longer term. Um, inode, improving the inode uh, quota um, is going into core ZFS. Uh, large D nodes is a feature that Livermore developed. Um, that allows extended attributes and things to be um, accessed more quickly from the underlying disk. Um, a bigger changes uh, include a declustered parity so that um, if you're doing RAID rebuilds in the, in the ZFS um, uh, VDEVs, that you can leverage the bandwidth of, you know, dozens of disks, you know, 100 disks at a time. And uh, that improves your rebuild speed. Um, a uh, separate uh, metadata allocation class so that you can store all of the ZFS file system metadata on separate um, flash devices uh, to improve your latency and things. And uh, also um, CPU optimizations, um, you know, not coincidentally from that work well with Intel CPUs, but um, you know, to, to optimize the, the support that's in, in new hardware to uh, you know, compute checksums and RAID parity and things like that, um, you know, to reduce the CPU demands and or allow higher throughput on a given um, piece of hardware. Um, another interesting uh, area that's, that's opened up in, in 2.8 and 2.9 is the focus on uh, adding, you know, security technology to Lustre and Lustre uh, integrating better with um, available features um, in the kernel. And uh, so that includes, um, you know, SE Linux, um, data encryption uh, over the network, which has existed in Kerberos for a while, but that, that support has been um, reinvigorated in 2.8. And uh, Indiana is working on um, shared key crypto um, for 2.9, which... Uh, you know, is simpler to uh, configure um, and leveraging both of those uh, uh, security technologies is a strong client authentication um, into uh, node groups. Um, so the basic utilization for the node groups is for doing UID and GID mapping for uh, WAN clients so that, you know, separate administrative domain um, can map their UIDs into a, a common uh, UID space for the, the central servers, but that's also a foundation for a number of other um, areas that are that are becoming available. Um, the ability to block uh, unauthorized clients by um, you know after they're you know if they're not authenticated, or to block um, you know to combining those technologies to have data isolation inside a fi single Lustre file system by blocking clients or by blocking users on clients from accessing uh, files outside of their security environment. And DDN's presenting um, a whole talk on that later. Um, so, you know, Lustre is a fairly large code base and it, it uh, um, you know, needs continuous attention to, uh, you know, to keep manageable and so that's, uh, you know, in some sense, it's, it's kind of the unloved work because it doesn't, you know, give you a whiz-bang new feature that you can, you know, write to your friends and family about. But um, 
you know, there's a lot of good work being done to clean up the code base. Um, it's interesting, I did some uh, line count comparisons between uh, 2.5 all the way through the 2.8 release. And while in aggregate, you know, over 250,000 lines of code were changed, there was only a net um, new 30,000 lines of code despite all of the features that have um, been developed since Lustre 2.5. And uh, a lot of that is due to, you know, removing old code, you know, cleaning up code to simplify it. And, um, you know, that makes, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, the simpler the code is, easier it is to understand. Those are bugs that are never going to be hit if they're gone completely. Um, also, for 2.9, we're hoping to finally uh, get rid of all of the kernel patches. Um, even today in 2.8, it's possible to build you know, Lustre um, clients, all clients have always been patchless, but the servers, um, for testing purposes in, in 2.8, we still needed to keep a patch. Um, but we're working around that in a different method, and so all of our server kernels will be patchless. Um, there's a feature that's um, being uh, implemented by DDN LAdvise, which is like POSIX FAdvise, but it, you know, instead of just talking to the, you know, the access from the client, it um, reaches out to the server to give tuning hints on the server for you know cache utilization. You know whether you you know read some file ahead, um, and Cray is uh, um, doing a related feature, which is the client um, lock ahead, so that uh, concurrently accessed files can optimize their access of the file. Like by default, Lustre, you know, trying to guess a heuristic about how files will be accessed and optimize the locking. But if the application knows in advance, you know, each client is going to be reading 47 megabytes of data, then it can tell um, in advance exactly what, what ranges of, of the data should be um, locked and prefetched. And uh, that significantly optimized the uh, read and write performance. Um, project quotas is a, a new feature as well um, that's gone into LDiscFS um, to a, a mark um, a quota allocation and tracking uh, for, you know, ostensibly for subdirectory trees, but um, it uh, um, is something that went into the upstream kernel, which makes it, you know, suitable for long-term maintenance and use. And there's a whole presentation on that, so I won't get into all the details. Um, networking improvement, there's quite a, a number that are coming in. I mean, LNet is one of the you know, very robust and critical parts of, of Lustre, and I think it's um, due to the speed and, and implementation of LNet that Lustre gets much of its performance. And um, so it, it doesn't change very much over time, but um, you know, there's new networking hardware technologies, um, Infiniband, um, the Melnox 5 driver, which has, you know, caused some grief because of changes in there. But, you know, fixes for that are um, slated for uh, 2.9. And a new Intel Omnipath um, network technology. Um, there's uh, uh, cryptography, Rand, I mentioned that under the security slide as well, but there's a uh, luster level cryptography. And so it's possible to use something like IPsec for TCP networks, but that, that doesn't work for RDMA. And so, um, you know, it's having the crypto built into luster works over all of the RDMA technologies as well. And uh, the, the multi-rail, I think, is the biggest change and something that people have been waiting for for a while, and it's, you know, finally arriving um, you know, this fall um, to allow not only failover between uh, multiple network paths, but also bandwidth sharing and aggregation, and not just within um, one network type, right? You can do failover um, and, and load sharing between InfiniBand and, uh, you know, Ethernet networks. And I think that's a fairly significant um, improvement. You know, it gets us above the level of, um, you know, 
depending on the, the, the reliability of the underlying hardware, um, the networking, which, you know, and especially as, as the cluster size gets larger and larger, the, um, the network technology is, you know, inevitably going to be faulty or flaky or cables and all of those things. Um, so this gets us above the, uh, the reliability of the underlying hardware. Um, there's also uh, improved performance um, for small files. And, uh, you know, despite the fact that for many years people said, oh, HPC, it's all the world of large files and streaming I.O., um, the, uh, you know, truth is, is that people have large numbers of small files. And, I, you know, partly I think it's, it's uh, you know, due to different um, loads and, and different groups of users appearing in uh, the HPC environment themselves, like genomics and things like that is upcoming and their data structures are, you know, well suited to small files. They split up, you know, one genome into millions and millions of small um, parts before processing. I mean, partly it might be because the people that are coming up in those environments, you know, they've been raised on desktops. They haven't had to, uh, you know, optimize every cycle like they did, you know, 40 years ago when they were writing Fortran. And so, um, you know, what they, they write and becomes their workflow on a, you know, their laptop or desktop, you know, suddenly they push it into HPC, you know, some giant cluster and it, you know, doesn't work as well as they had hoped. And, uh, you know, I mean, we can tell them, oh, you should restructure all of your code, but we should also, you know, strive to work well in all environments. And so the small file optimizations um, have been work underway for a while. And uh, instead of storing the small files, um, you know, in two parts, like Lustre does with the metadata and separate data, um, the very small files, and what's small is tunable, but uh, typically, you know, uh, under a megabyte or under 64K or something like that, would be stored on the MDT so that, you know, you can do in a single RPC, you can read, or, you know, open the file, get all the attributes, um, potentially read, you know, all of the file data, 64K of file data, and return it to the client in one network round trip rather than doing, you know, three or four um, RPCs, you know, to the MDS and then the OSS and getting locks and things back. Um, so this has a, just at the protocol level, there's good optimization. Um, this, the synergistic um, improvement is that, you know, the MDS has storage that's well tuned for, um, you know, small file access, right? It'll typically be flash or, you know, high IOPS, you know, SAS, RAID 10 versus RAID 6. That's the typical for the OSTs. And um, so that will also improve the performance. And uh, with DNE striped directories, you can horizontally scale that across multiple metadata servers and metadata targets. Um, so we don't have, um, you know, performance numbers on this. It's still under development, but, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, um, has a good potential to improve all of these, these bottlenecks. Um, another area that's uh, very interesting um, to me and I think is important for usability is uh, progressive file layouts. And um, this is, there's a, a, a presentation on the performance um, of this and I won't go into too many details, but it gives you the ability to, you know, either by default or explicitly select um, different layouts for different parts of the, uh, of a single file. And, you know, this can be integrated with libraries like HDF5 and things like that. But uh, just from a usability point of view, you know, this solves one of the, the big pain points of how regular users interact with Lustre, especially if they don't know, you know, not familiar with using Lustre, that the layout of a file is created when it's first opened and it stays static for the rest of the lifetime of that file. And so if you know what you're doing, you pick, you know, single stripe files for, you know, smaller, um, you know, file for process jobs and then widely striped files for, you know, concurrently accessed and very large files. But, you know, 
many users get it wrong. And you know, like I said, we can you know, there's a user education, you know, ongoing effort. But realistically, it's better that you know we strive to work well um, out of the box for you know users who don't know how to use Lustre. And so this gives you um, you know the ability to optimize um, usage for a wide variety of uh, different um, usage cases, and it also pr paves the uh, paves the way for a feature that. Um, I think has has been um, a long time coming for Lustre, which is file level redundancy. Um, by uh, you know, and and some people, you know, believe that that uh, redundancy and replication at the file level is you know a lot of overhead for HPC, where you know we're focused on um, you know squeaking the last bit of performance out, but uh, um, you know. Availability is also an important factor for um, HPC, and Lustre is also moving into non-HPC areas. And um, so, with file um, redundancy, we can do um, mirroring across multiple OSTs, and um, also erasure coding, um, so that you can store, you know, a parity. Um, you know, a 10 plus 2 or whatever, 20 plus 3 type of, of parity across multiple OSTs. Um, the initial phase, this is going to be a phased deployment. Um, and, uh, you know, it builds on top of the functionality of, of PFL. But, um, you know, initially there will be essentially read, um, read only redundancy for files, you know, that appears asynchronously after a file is created, right? I mean, I would hope that, you know, Luster is not being used in, you know, banking transaction processing, right? So, um, you know, getting up to the second, you know, replicas of a, of a transaction is not the primary use case. So having asynchronous uh, replicas appear, you know, within um, minutes of the file completing write and having that offloaded to other servers than the compute nodes um, is actually an advent advantage of that kind of structure because the clients can still write their data as quickly as possible, and then you get some nodes that are central to the storage servers to build replication in the background. And uh, it also provides a, the foundation for a large number of other features, such as tiered storage classes, so that you can have you know, one of your copies on, on hard drives, and then before the job, you can pre-stage it into Flash that's, you know, built into the compute cluster. Um, and, uh, um, you know, or having things like a WAN replica of the data, um, you know, on the other side of a slow link. Um, partial file uh, restore for HSM so that you can start accessing your data before the whole file has been restored from tape. Um, file versioning, you know, if you have essentially a, a replica of the file that never gets updated, you know, that's essentially a backup of that file. And it can be available, you know, online. Um, and, uh, you know, there's just a, a wide variety of, of areas that, um, you know, can be addressed by this feature. And so, you know, it says 2.11. I mean, 2.11 would be, you know, the first the, the first part of the functionality would be available, you know, in that time frame. And of course, like everything, there's disclaimers about, you know, these are all features that are work in progress, but, um, you know, this would be a, a incremental uh, deployment and development. So there's other areas um, beyond, uh, you know, the features that, that are in immediate development. There's also research that um, Intel is funding at a number of uh, universities, um, you know, for for many years, um, you know, I go to the FAST conference and see people working on research on different file systems that were, you know, originated at universities. And Luster, you know, has been doing the hard work in industry for uh, many years, and maybe hasn't gotten the love from from universities. But um, you know, so this is this is the 
turn around and um, uh, there's good work that's being done um, you know, in the next year or two. Um, DKRZ and Hamburg uh, are working on uh, improving data compression, um, both to uh, optimize um, the bandwidth um, utilization, uh, but also uh, you know, reduced space consumption. And um, so, I mean, Livermore has been running ZFS with data compression, but currently ZFS itself only allows you to set one type of data compression for the whole file system. And so they're, uh, they're do doing research on how to optimize the data compression based on um, the current system workload and CPU speeds versus how much, how quickly the data is coming in and access patterns and whether the data itself is compressible. And uh, so that'll give you a better overall um, you know, value from that feature. And also they're looking at uh, doing data, uh, client side data compression. And um, you know, so that will, will optimize your bandwidth over slower links or if there's congestion on the network from many clients. And uh, you know, not on the slide, but of interest is that once something like client side data compression is, is available, it's conceivable to also do client side um, data encryption Right, it's the, the infrastructure is, and not just for over the network, but client-side data encryption that gets stored encrypted on the servers, right? So it's end-to-end -end data encryption. Um, GSI, they're uh, uh, leveraging um, work that was uh, done in Lustre 2.5 and later for uh, HSM, and they're making a, a, a copy tool interface for uh, what's used to be called TSM, and that's how it was until Intel changed the name. It's something, or sorry, not Intel, IBM. It's like Spectrum Protect or something like that. I don't remember. But um, so most people know it as TSM. Um, University of Santa Cruz is, uh, uh, they presented yesterday at the uh, developer day. Uh, they're doing automated client side um, Load balancing is maybe not quite the right term. It's a, a data congestion avoidance, um, IO congestion avoidance to uh, optimize throughput when there's many clients and different workloads running concurrently um, to get a better aggregate um, throughput and reduce latency for competing jobs. Um, uh, Johannes Gutenberg at the University of Mainz, um, they're doing um, adaptive uh, network request scheduling on the server, um, which is complementary to the client-side um, work to, uh, you know, tune at a global level uh, job um, I.O. submission so that you have uh, lower contention between competing jobs. And Berkeley are all working with uh, Spark and Hadoop to, um, you know, interface Lustre in HPC environments, you know, with uh, the different, um, you know, computing technologies that come from Hadoop and to optimize their I.O. patterns for Lustre. And that's it. Um, legalese. And we're finished. I don't know if I have time for questions or not. Okay. Questions, I guess. James. Um, so maybe that was, um, maybe that's a little bit confusing. It's not, it's not encrypted at the RDMA level. It's, it's Kerberos and shared key crypto. It's just luster transport encryption over top of RDMA. It's just because we, you know, IPsec, which we use in like Intel Cloud Edition, um, you can't use IPsec over non-IP networks, right? And so by having the, the Lustre encryption at the, the portal RPC layer, it can go over any transport, right? OPA and, and you know, Cray, um, Genie or whatever, right? We don't need to have um, network specific uh, data encryption. Hi, okay. Shadow. Shadow?
Uh, so the question was, what's the difference between this and the current portal RPC encryption? Nothing. It's just an, I, I it just is, thought it, it was. It's it just a clean up for current par, par, portal, portal and RPC encryption code, which created a long time ago. Yeah, and so, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm just throwing people off here. This is exactly portal RPC encryption. Yes. This is, it's so just it's using the same GSS API. So the Kerberos, which has existed, you know, was, was, was got working again in 2.8. Um, so this is the shared key that's coming in 2.9 is also using GSS API. And maybe I just totally threw people off. I just wanted to summarize the improvements in the network space. Um, but it's, it's secure portal RPC. So I have a question about maybe a DMA encryption. Does that mean the NET level CPU encryption? Is that right? Sorry, the LNET level? CPU uh, encryption by CPU, is that right? Uh, encryption? Yeah, encryption, uh, decoding and... Oh, yeah, so it's, it's using the kernel crypto API. Uh, so maybe a, 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 en encryption and decryption in the CPU in the kernel mode? And yeah, in the, the CPU, <laughs> yeah, and so it's not... That's not, not make sense <laughs> because... Uh, Oh, yes. CPU copy the same. Yeah, so the, um, the, you know, it's worthwhile mentioning here. So this uses, I mean, for many different reasons, A, because crypto is hard, and, you know, B, because it's hard to ship software with crypto because of export regulations and things like that, and C, because there's many, um, you know, hardware, you know, either in the CPU level or external card, um, you know, accelerator cards for crypto, but Lustre is using the, the Linux kernel crypto API to implement all of the encryption algorithms, um, you know, AES and things like that. And um, so that, you know, frees us from doing, you know, difficult to get right crypto work and also leverages, you know, optimized CPU level um, offload uh, technologies to get very good um, encryption rates, you know, in, into the multi gigabytes a second. So it's, it's um, you know, suitable for use with Lustre. Right this way, Mr. Simmons. I'm, I'm, I'm all over it, man. Okay, take it away. One last question is, does that address the issue of the hash, di uh, the hash di digest size? Because currently it's 64. Uh, Are you talking about compared to the uh, data level of checksums or? Yeah, what? the checksums, because the checksums are like, we, we transported it as like 32 bits over there and that limits it to like the 64. Yeah, yeah. so the, um, the uh, when you're doing full, um, you're doing the full encryption, I mean there's multiple modes and I'm not gonna go into the whole thing, but you can have different um, encryption, if you wanna call them that, or, or authentication levels for just the message traffic, right? I mean, the current, the current code only does checksumming on the data, the bulk data transport. And if you use this S portal RPC, um, you can do hashing or authentication or encryption um, of the message traffic, like the RPCs themselves, separately from the bulk data traffic. So you could only do, you know, authentication of the bulk traffic, or you can do full encryption of the bulk traffic. And all of those have you know, 256 bit or 1024 bit or whatever um, hashes, right? Okay. The full, you know, AES and, and SHA sizes, right? It's not, it, and it, it, as I had just recently asked about and checked, when secure portal RPC is enabled on a transport, um, a, the bulk, the checksums are turned off, so you don't do double checksumming, right? And so it doesn't, you know, double your overhead, right? The, the data level checksums are turned off. 